Hello from the southwest side of Madison, Wisconsin. It is Wednesday evening, October 19th, 2022. We are here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ. We are in Genesis chapter 20 tonight, so you may want to be getting a Bible ready and meet me in that passage in just a few moments. Genesis chapter 20. The text is all that really matters these days in terms of God communicating to us. He has spoken to us through his word, the Bible, and so we will be spending some time in Genesis chapter 20 tonight in just a few moments, but we're glad that you are with us tonight. I want to warn you in advance, this is a rather short chapter, and I hope you're not disappointed. The class may be a little bit shorter than usual, but we have some pretty big things happening over in chapter 21, and it really doesn't make sense to move partway into that chapter tonight. So we will uh, just be looking at Genesis 20 tonight, and we want to also invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a Bible study and 10.30 for our worship assembly, when God's people get together to partake of the Lord's Supper and to pray and to sing and to give and so on. And I would say tonight as we get started, if you have any questions about what you see or hear taught in our class tonight, give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would certainly love to hear from you. And a thanks to those of you who've helped us by subscribing to the YouTube channel over the past few days. We were aiming for 100 subscribers so that YouTube would allow us to create a custom name for our YouTube channel. And the last time I checked uh, this afternoon or earlier today, we were up to, I think, at least 102, if I remember correctly. So thank you so much for doing that. And if you've not done it already, uh, we would invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. But uh, thank you again very much for your help with this. We really appreciate that. Uh, tonight we are back to Genesis, the book of beginnings, written by Moses. We've been studying the life of Abraham over the past couple months here. Uh, he's been promised a son. And God has renewed that promise several times now. And last week we studied the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. You may remember those two men who were actually angels. They scoped out Sodom. It was definitely as bad as they had heard. And so they basically had to drag Lot, Mrs. Lot, and their two daughters out of the city right before God destroys it. Uh, by the way, when I went up to visit the church in Spencer, Wisconsin, this past Sunday night, Jeff Smith was preaching their gospel meeting. Jeff is from Shelbyville, Tennessee which is practically right down the road from Lynchburg, Tennessee, where my grandfather preached for a number of years. But uh, this past Sunday night, Jeff preached on leaving a legacy with your family, based in part on what happens in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. And he compared and contrasted the spiritual legacy that was left by Lot as opposed to the legacy left by Abraham. If you remember, uh, Lot chose the good land, even though it was right next to Sodom, leaving the less desirable land uh, for his uncle Abraham. And you may remember he paid for that decision with the life of his wife and the loss of pretty much all of his physical possessions, if I understand that correctly. We don't have a record of him really getting anything out other than himself and his family. And then he also lost his daughters, spiritually speaking, and he lost the respect of his potential future sons-in-law. And of course, his daughters ended up getting him drunk and having kids with him, and uh, those kids end up becoming the start of the Moabites and the Ammonites, and those two nations were pretty much enemies of God's chosen people throughout the Old Testament. Uh, with the exception of one woman was a pretty good Moabitess, if you remember, Ruth was a Moabite. So Ruth is one of the uh, rather famous Moabites, and uh, she we would count in the good column. She was a God-fearing woman. Anyway, Abraham, on the other hand, obviously left quite a different spiritual legacy for his descendants. He certainly wasn't perfect, and we're going to see that yet again in tonight's class. But I think we would agree that Abraham was faithful. Not perfect, but faithful, and his descendants were certainly blessed as a result of his faith. Uh, at the gospel meeting on Sunday night, the preacher was asking whether our own great-great-grandchildren will be faithful to the Lord. Will they even know the Lord at all? Uh, chances are that was not the case for Lot, and yet it was for the case of Abraham. Abraham did something right. And Lot definitely had some serious issues with his children. So that's kind of where we leave it. By the way, had a good time going up to Spencer. It went well. And I just kind of chuckle at that. What a difference it is here in the north to go to a gospel meeting for a neighboring congregation. You may end up driving uh, two or three hours. And that is certainly the way it happened this past, uh, this past Sunday evening. But a good experience. 
And it was good to give some encouragement, I hope, but also to receive some encouragement from the uh, good congregation up there in Spencer. So with this, let's jump back into Genesis chapter 20. So Genesis 20 is where we start tonight. The first paragraph is verses 1 through 7. So Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. So Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, She is my sister? And she herself said, He is my brother? In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, Yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart you have done this, and I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Well, in verse 1, we find that Abraham moves, and we're not really told why, but some have speculated that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah might have factored in here, that Abraham just needed to uh, get away from that. And of course, Abraham was a wanderer. He spent his life wandering, going from place to place. But maybe word got out that Abraham might have had something to do with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe word got out that he knew in advance, which he did. Um, it's also possible that Abraham needed some better land for his flocks. So maybe he exhausted the land where he was and simply needed to move for that reason. We're not told. Uh, but remember, he was in the bad land where he was. And the better land uh, had at one time been close to Sodom. That's the land that Lot chose to live in. But it's not like he was uh, about to move even closer to that land near Sodom now that Lot had moved out. That obviously wouldn't seem right. And this might have been Abraham's motive for moving. We don't know. Ultimately, we're not told. All we know from verse 1 is that Abraham moves to Gerar. Gerar is, I believe, southwest of where Abraham had been. It's uh, still in the land that God had promised, but it is much closer to the land of the Philistines, right there on the edge of their property. In verse 2, we get something, uh, we get back to something that's uh, getting to be a little bit familiar to us now, isn't it? So as Abraham arrives in Gerar, he puts word out that Sarah, his wife, is actually his sister. And because of this, Abimelech, the local king, takes Sarah. And I'm thinking, just kind of uh, off the top of my head here, Sarah must have been one beautiful and impressive woman. And so she is uh, taken by a couple kings now. And so they see her and they want her to be with them. And so uh, 90 years old or so at this point, but a very beautiful woman, I'm sure. Um, so he takes Sarah. I don't think he really marries her at this point, but he takes her. Uh, obviously, there is something uh, like romantic going on here. Wife status is probably out there on the horizon, if we could imagine. But he might have also taken her just as a concubine or uh, something like that, whatever his culture would have said to do. However, God appears to Abimelech in a dream that night and says, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. You know, notice that uh, Abimelech is the king of the nation. You know, what he says goes. He's a king. He can declare what marriage law is, and yet that, of course, is not the not the truth at all. God's marriage law uh, is above uh, any marriage uh, law of the land. Uh, also, just a side note here, if you remember, we've been referring to this period of time as the patriarchal age, where God primarily communicates directly with uh, heads of households, we might say, and this is uh, certainly true outside of those we would normally consider to be God's chosen people. And so God isn't just talking to Abraham, but he is communicating to other people outside of his chosen people. Uh, this guy is most likely a pagan of some kind, certainly not a worshiper of the one true God, although perhaps he is now. Uh, but God communicates with this man in a dream. And that just reminds us that the patriarchal age covers everybody, all cultures in all places up to the time of the cross. So God is certainly concerned for Abimelech, even though he's not one of his chosen people. You know, yes, God is concerned about Abraham, but that certainly does not keep him from being concerned about Abimelech as well. 
And just a quick note or side note on the patriarchal age, during this time, it was not yet a sin to marry your sister. So we just need to point that out here, kind of dealing with what Abraham has done. Uh, that prohibition actually comes later uh, at the time of Moses over in Leviticus 19, or uh, I think 18 verses 9 through 11 maybe, and also in Leviticus 20 verse 17, there are a couple verses about not marrying your sister or another close relative. Uh, but here though, what Abraham does is not yet against God's law. So uh, Abraham is on safe ground having married his sister. Uh, but if he had lived a few hundred years later, he would not have been because the law had changed. God added something to uh, his requirements for the, for the Jewish people. Well, the issue here is that Abimelech is in the process of taking Abraham's wife, even though he doesn't realize it at the time. Uh, but I think we would kind of take from this, ignorance is no excuse, is it? He's still guilty. He doesn't know he's guilty until God confronts him on this, but he is in fact guilty of doing this. Obviously, God could have just killed Abimelech right there on the spot, but that apparently would not have been fair. And this is what Abimelech himself points out to God. Notice starting in verse 4, um, I did not know. I didn't know this. How can it be right to destroy our entire nation even though we're blameless? And let's remember, Abimelech is certainly uh, quite familiar with what just happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is just not too far away at all. So when the same God who destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah comes to you in a dream and says that you're a dead man, uh, I'm kind of thinking that you take this seriously, as Abimelech does. But he also realizes that it, this is really not his fault. He understands what he's done once God points it out to him, but it's hard to blame the man. And and this is what Abimelech brings up in the presence of God. Uh, but speaking of fault, uh, let's also realize today that we as well can sin without even knowing it. Right? There are things, we can do things today that are sinful even though we don't know that they're sinful. And we may be held to account before God for doing those things. Uh, in fact, it's possible to marry somebody today. Uh, thinking that we're doing a good thing when we're actually doing something that is absolutely an abomination in the eyes of God. That's not right at all. Well, in this case, Abimelech was deceived into this, uh, entering into this relationship. But even the deception didn't mean that Abimelech could proceed with his plans to marry Sarah. He couldn't say, well, God, I just didn't know about it, but uh, thank you for letting me keep this wonderful woman. That That's not the way this went down. Sarah was off limits to this man, even if Abimelech didn't know it at the time. To marry her uh, would have been an abomination in the eyes of God. It would have brought some uh, catastrophic consequences to Abimelech and his people if he had continued down this path without repenting. In this case, Abimelech explains to God that both Abraham and Sarah had very clearly said that uh, Sarah was Abraham's sister. And I would just ask here, haven't we seen this before? This is not new to us. So yes, this is beginning to become a habit for Abraham. Only now, a little bit different from the first time, Sarah is very clearly in on this as well. Previously, uh, these two had done almost exactly the same thing when they traveled down to Egypt. You may remember Abraham was scared that Pharaoh would kill him in order to have Sarah. And so he simply claimed that she was his sister. And of course, back then, God punishes Pharaoh and Abraham heads out loaded down with these gifts from the king of Egypt. Kind of sorry for taking your wife kind of presence. Uh, but again, this passage is slightly different because we are specifically told here that Sarah is in on this uh, at this point. Abimelech, therefore, makes his case to God. I did not know any better. In fact, they both told me that she, in fact, was his sister. So notice in verse 6, God responds, and God is reasonable here. Uh, this isn't like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who were sinning willfully, going into it with their eyes wide open. This is different. Abimelech did this with integrity of heart. He meant well. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know that this was wrong. And in fact, God actually prevents Abimelech from going through with this somehow. God didn't let Abimelech touch her. And I'm a little bit curious uh, how that went down. You know, what did that look like? I don't know, like some kind of uh, force field around Sarah. Did he try and he he couldn't do it? I, I don't know. Is it some kind of illness? Uh, we're not told. Who knows? We, we don't know the answer to that. But the solution is 
uh, restore her. That is, send her back. Give her back to Abraham. And in this process, God says that since Abraham is a prophet, he will pray for you and you will live. Otherwise, you will die along with all who are yours. So repent or else. Uh, just a quick note on another first in Genesis. This, remember, is the book of beginnings, a book of first. Uh, in verse 7, as Abraham is described by God as being a prophet. This is the first use of the word prophet in the Bible. And we don't always realize that Abraham is considered by God to be a prophet. And I know we just did that series on prophecy in the Bible a few months back. And so as we have discussed in the fairly recent past, a prophet is someone who speaks forth on God's behalf, God's spokesperson. It may involve predicting the future, but it might involve just passing along a message from God. I know today a lot of people hear the word prophecy and they think future, future telling, foretelling something that can be included in being a prophet, but not necessarily. The word prophet simply means speaking forth on God's behalf. So Abraham then is authorized to speak on God's behalf. So let's continue then with Genesis 20, verses 8 through 13. This is our next paragraph. Genesis 20, verses 8 through 13. So Abimelech arose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their hearing, and the men were greatly frightened. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you, that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done to me things that ought not to be done. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What have you encountered that you have done this thing? Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely there is no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. And it came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, This is the kindness which you will show to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. In verse 8, Abimelech gets up early the next morning, um, <clears throat> gets the whole gang together, so he doesn't keep this secret. Uh, this is something everybody needs to know about. He explains this message from God. Uh, everybody is greatly frightened. They are terrified. Uh, so literally, they are God-fearing people at this point, aren't they? They fear God. They hear the message from God through Abimelech, and they are absolutely uh, scared to death. Remember, they also would have been very familiar with what just happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abimelech would have known that. These people would have known that. And they obviously do not want that to happen to them. In verse 9, Abimelech also calls Abraham now in for a meeting. And how embarrassing this must have been. We've got this pagan king calling in the father of the faithful and rebuking him for this deception. What have you done to us? You know, this is clearly Abraham's fault. Basically, what have we done to you to deserve being treated this way? You know, how have I sinned against you? What brought this on? What have I done? And then you have done to me things that ought not to be done. This is just wrong. And in verse 10, as I understand it, Abimelech basically wants to know why. What have you encountered uh, that you have done this thing? In other words, what caused you to do this? What were you thinking when you did this? This king wants to know, what's your motivation here? And Abraham gives an answer very similar to his reasoning back in Egypt. He was scared. He was afraid. And he was afraid because he thought that there is no fear of God in this place and that these people would kill him to have his wife. Isn't that sad? Uh, just a note here on the sin of prejudice. Abraham had prejudged these people, hadn't he? He had assumed something very negative about these people that was not true at all. And how sad that is. Let's be careful. We don't do the same thing today. We may look at the world around us and say, they're too evil to reach with the gospel, so I'm not even going to try. Well, that's a dangerous thing to say, isn't it? And I think Abraham learned this lesson here. Not only did he misjudge Abimelech and his people, I would also suggest that Abraham misjudged God's ability to protect him. If God had promised he and Sarah a son by this time next year, that won't happen if they're dead, will it? 
So Abraham, therefore, he should have known better. He should have trusted God even more uh, than he did. Well, starting in verse 12, Abraham explains that this is why I'm somewhat justified in what I did. And he explains that Sarah really is his sister, the daughter of his father, not the daughter of his mother. So kind of half-sister, I guess we would say. And then they got married. So making her both his sister and his wife. And he explains that as God had made him a traveler, Abraham had asked his wife as an act of kindness to explain that he is her brother. So this is how it's going down, dear. When we travel, I need you to do this favor for me. You know, tell the kings that we encounter along the way that you're, um, that you are my sister. But what I do appreciate in this is that Abraham takes responsibility for this, doesn't he? He doesn't just say, it's not my fault, that kind of thing. I mean, he explains, of course, but he does take responsibility. He doesn't blame it on Sarah. You know, he didn't pull a Garden of Eden, you know, where she made me do it, that kind of thing. This is not her fault. This is on me. Uh, I think I've known some men who would have blamed it on their wives at this point. Dear, I can't believe you made me say that or whatever. Uh, but Abraham takes responsibility, which is certainly admirable. So let's conclude tonight. The last paragraph here is Genesis 20, verses 14 through 18. Genesis chapter 20, verses 14 through 18. Abimelech then took sheep and oxen and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored his wife Sarah to him. Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Settle wherever you please. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, it is your vindication before all who are with you and before all men you are cleared. Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maids so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Starting in verse 14, Abimelech works to make this right. Very honorable man. Once he learns the truth, uh, he takes steps to fix this. So he gives to Abraham all kinds of sheep and oxen and male and female servants. He returns Sarah as well. He restores her. Interesting way of putting that. In addition to all of this, Abimelech then gives Abraham the option of settling in the best of the land. So wherever you want to live in my land, go for it. It's yours. You just travel, you just pitch your tent there, and wherever you settle, that is now your land, not mine. He then addresses Sarah, and he explains that he's given her brother. Notice, isn't that interesting? Not her husband, but I gave your brother a thousand pieces of silver, and that this is her vindication. In other words, this gift is proof that this was not her fault, but that it was his fault, Abimelech's fault, Abimelech wants everybody to know that Abraham and Sarah are okay in all of this. So it's like a declaration of okayness. Um, you are all right with me. This is all good now. They are not to be blamed here. They are clear and vindicated according to uh, what he says at the end of verse 16. And we'll get back to that in, in just a moment. Uh, but for now, Abraham prays to God on Abimelech's behalf. Everybody is healed. Uh, God had prevented them apparently from bearing any children during this brief incident. But now, though, that curse is lifted. But we've got Abraham, who has this special relationship with God as a prophet, interceding on behalf of others here. If you remember, we had Abraham doing something very similar, didn't we, at the end of chapter 18, as he bargained with God concerning how many righteous people would need to be found before God would spare Sodom and Gomorrah. And in a similar way, uh, Abraham goes to God on Abimelech's behalf, asking God to spare them. Well, this brings us to the end of chapter 20, and um, and I have some questions on this chapter. I don't, I don't know if you do as well. I hope you have some issues with this. I mean, I've got some issues with what happens here, and uh, you may as well. Uh, on the surface, it sure does seem that Abraham and Sarah both lie, right? And that Abimelech is punished for their lie, and that Abraham and Sarah are rewarded for it. Isn't that kind of seem what, what happens here? Like what's happening? And to me, that's very similar to uh, almost exactly comparable to what happened with Pharaoh down in Egypt. You know, Abraham seems to lie. And not only does he get away with it, but the victim is punished. And Abraham walks away with piles of gold and silver and flocks and herds and, and servants and, and all of that as a seemingly uh, uh, a seeming a reward for lying. You know, so my question is, have we missed something here? 
you know, because that doesn't seem right. Maybe we have, maybe we have missed something in all of this. Um, it's interesting that Abraham is not condemned by God for what he does. Have you noticed that in these two passages? You know, not only is he rewarded by pagan kings, but we don't have God condemning Abraham for this, either with Pharaoh in Egypt or with Abimelech in Gerar. But instead, Pharaoh and Abimelech are the ones who suffer the consequences. So not only is Abraham not reprimanded, but God um, has the victims here reward Abraham for what he does. And I would note also that although what Abraham says appears to be pretty deceptive, it is not necessarily and perhaps technically a lie. And let me clarify that just a little bit. First of all, yes, uh, Sarah is technically his sister. Uh, she is his half-sister, but she is his sister. Over in the New Testament, in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, you may remember that John, the author, twice refers to Jesus' half-brothers as his brothers. He doesn't say they were Jesus' half-brothers, but he refers to them simply as Jesus' brothers. Even though, unlike them, Jesus was the son of Mary, but not the son of Joseph. So I'm just saying that technically then, if we want to think in those terms, even the Bible sometimes refers to half-brothers as brothers. And that is what Abraham and Sarah do here. Secondly, something else we may want to consider is the question, are we always obligated to tell somebody everything we know about a situation? You know, there is an interesting account over in 1 Samuel 16 where God tells Samuel to go anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. Well, you may remember Saul is still the king at that point. And Samuel fears for his life, though, since if word gets out that this is why he's going, and if Saul finds out about it, Saul will have him killed. And you may remember from 1 Samuel 16 that God says to Samuel, Take a heifer with you and say... I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, which he does. And this is at the direct command of the Lord. So this isn't just Samuel making up this, perhaps, deception, if we look at it in this way. This is God telling him to do that. And so I'm just saying, apparently then, we are not obligated to tell everything we know about a situation. And let's also note, God did not tell Samuel to lie, did he? That's not what's going on there. He was traveling to offer a sacrifice. He was also coming to anoint a new king who would eventually take Saul's place. Uh, but he was not obligated to tell the whole story. And so, of course, if Abraham had said, Sarah is not my wife, he would have been lying. And I think he obviously would have been punished and rebuked by God for doing that. But as it is, though... He never actually said that. He said that she was his sister. So he was focusing on part of that relationship in order to uh, get him in and out of those countries safely. It's not ideal. I'm just saying this is uh, what he actually did. And as we study these two accounts in Genesis, you know, I think we do learn something from noting who is punished in both accounts. In both situations, the kings are punished. Abraham and Sarah are not punished. In fact, they are rewarded. And even beyond this, Abraham is held up as the solution, um, especially in the case of Abimelech, as God specifically tells Abimelech that Abraham would pray for him so that he and his family would live. Well, obviously, both Pharaoh and Abimelech are upset with what Abraham does, uh, but I don't think we have a record of God actually being upset with what Abraham does, which really speaks to what he does, perhaps not necessarily being wrong. It, and it seems deceptive, but that's something at least for us to think about here. Um, you know, even in the recent past, I've thought about Abraham as being wrong here. You know, I, I've thought about Abraham as having lied on these two scenarios. Uh, but I do think we do need to be careful not to accuse Abraham of doing something that he uh, didn't necessarily do. Now, in my opinion, I don't think that what Abraham did here was necessarily wise. Uh, in my opinion, it certainly demonstrates a lack of faith in God to protect him as he traveled. But I'm just saying that we need to be careful in how we characterize what Abraham does in these two passages, especially since we don't have him being condemned. Uh, another quick note on something I had forgotten until I studied this account earlier today. Uh, Isaac apparently learns from his father's example. 
Isaac, of course, hadn't been born yet at this point, but he certainly would have heard about this as he grew up. But several years later, Isaac does almost the exact same thing with his wife, Rebecca. And amazingly, he tells the same story to the same king, to King Abimelech. If you have a Bible, you may want to turn just briefly as we close here over to Genesis 26, verses 6 through 11. So a few years later here, obviously. But this is over in Genesis 26, 6 through 11. This is what the Bible says. Genesis 26, starting in verse 6. So Isaac lived in Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister. For he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking, The men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw... And behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. <laughs> then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isn't that interesting? I mean, anyway, to me, it seems that Abimelech is finally onto these people. <laughs> you can't trust them. Uh, you know, got to be careful here. And so he looks out his window and he just happens to catch Isaac caressing Rebecca. And he's thinking, that is not very brother sisterly. You know, that something's messed up here. I've seen this before. And he's seen that, of course, with Abraham and Sarah. But I'm just saying that whatever happens here seems to be running in the family. Isaac has obviously learned from his father, Abraham. And one more thing before we close tonight. What if Abimelech had actually had relations with Sarah? And what if she had become pregnant as a result of that? Have we thought about what that would have done to the promise made by God that Sarah would bear a child with Abraham within the year? Have we thought about that? So let's not miss this. There, there is a whole lot at stake here. Abraham seems to have been extremely, extremely foolish in allowing his wife to be taken by this foreign king, especially right after God promises that she would bear him a son within that year. So I would say this is just a, another close call for Abraham, but he does make it out of it even wealthier than he was before. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930 as we uh, get back to studying the Word of God. And then after class, we also plan on coming together for our worship assembly at 1030. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for communicating to us through your Word. And we're especially thankful tonight for Genesis, the book of beginnings. I thank you for Abraham and thank you for introducing us to this man of great faith. Like us, he was by no means perfect, but he was faithful. And tonight we pray for his faith, the faith of Abraham, that we would learn to trust you in everything that we do. We come to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.